to make industry less destructive activities such as reduce avoid minimize sustain limit and halt have long been on the main agendas of the environmentalist but how did they start as the industry spread people started noticing changes in nature at the end of the 18th century thomas malthus an influential economist published a book an essay on the principle of population predicting the exponential growth of human population and warning that it would bring devastating consequences for humankind it was at the time when population growth was viewed as a positive thing George Perkins Mas as some consider him the father of the environmental movement was one of the first to understand man's capacity for lasting destruction on the environment His most famous book Man and Nature published in 1864 highlighted the importance of a harmonious relationship between the human kind and the natural world and warned of the negative impact if natural resources is used up too quickly the book made an enormous positive impact on the foresters artists thinkers and conservationists later Aldo Leopold an ecologist and naturalist expressed some feelings of guilt in his publication he wrote when i submit these thoughts to a printing press i am helping cut down the woods when i pour cream in my coffee i am helping to train a mass for cows to graze and to exterminate the birds of brazil when i go birding or hunting in my fold i am devastating an oil field and relicting an imperialism to get me rubber nay more when i father more than two children i'm creating as insatiable need for more printing presses more cows more coffee more oil to supply with more birds more trees and more flowers will either be killed or evicted from their several environments as a result Conservation societies such as Sierra Club and the Wilderness Society were established that help preserve wilderness and keep it safe from industrial growth. The definition of environmentalism at that time was very limited though. It was mainly about protesting deforestation, mining destruction, factory pollution and other visible changes and seeking to preserve specially appreciated landscapes. However, It wasn't until really later the publications of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring in 1962 when she pointed out that human-made chemicals particularly pesticides such as DDT were bad for the natural world. Almost a decade later, Silent Spring led to the banning of DDT in the United States and Germany. Seriously, scientists and politicians formed groups such as Environmental Defense the Natural Resources Defense Council, the World Wildlife Federation, and the Bund, that's the German Federation for Environmental and Nature Conservation. By this point, environmentalists were no longer only interested to preserve, but in monitoring and reducing toxins. Shortly after Silent Spring, in 1968, Paul Ehrlich, a pioneer of modern environmentalism and an eminent biologist, published The Population Bomb, in which he predicted that 1970s and 1980s would see a resource shortage expecting the death of hundreds of millions of people. Additionally, he also pointed out humans' habit of using atmosphere as a garbage dump. He asked, "What do we gain by playing environmental roulette?" In 1972, Donella and Dennis Meadows and the Club of Rome published another serious warning: the limits to growth. The authors noted that resources were depleting due to population growth and concluded, if the present growth trends in world population, industrialization, pollution, food production and resources depletion continue unchanged, the limit to growth on this planet will reach sometime within the next 100 years. In 1984, Ehrlich published another book with his wife Anne, The Population Explosion, stating, "Then the fuse was burning. Now the population bomb has detonated." They pointed out the primary cause of our planet's unease is the overgrowth of the human population and its impact on both ecosystem and human communities. As these environmentalists were issuing an important warning, suggestions were being made the ways consumers could reduce their negative impact on the environment. In 1998 book Useless Stuff Environmental Solutions for Who We Really Are 
Robert Lillian Field and William Ratz mentioned, the best way to reduce any environmental impacts is not to recycle more, but to produce and dispose of less. But industry was not listening to them. And it stayed like this until the industry began to realize the harm they were creating. And it wasn't until decades later. In a response, the Rio Earth Summit happened in 1992, where approximately 30,000 people from 167 countries gathered in Rio de Janeiro. The group's report stressed the importance of eco-efficiency for all companies that aim to be competitive, sustainable, and successful in the long term by making the machines that has cleaner, faster, quieter engines. Although many big corporations such as 3M and Johnson & Johnson adopted the term in their business models, to their disappointment, the definition of ecosystem was too vague. Now let's try to understand what exactly is eco-efficiency. The definition eco-efficiency means doing more with less. But that still doesn't say much, right? How much of a less is less? To understand this, let's look at the famous environmental movement, that is 4 R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, and regulate. Reduce. Whether it's a matter of eliminating toxic waste or cutting down the use of raw materials, the reduction is one of the main point of eco-efficiency. But having said that, the reduction does not stop depletion and destruction completely. In fact, it only slows them down. Reuse Another waste reduction strategy is incineration, which has better reputation than landfilling due to waste to energy conversion. But waste in incinerator burn only because valuable materials like paper and plastic are flammable. For once, we have to think that since these materials were never designed to be safely burned, they release toxins. Although many industries and customers feel good if they find a way to reuse waste, but in many cases, this waste and many toxins are simply being transferred to another place. Unless materials are specifically designed to ultimately become safe food for nature, even biodegradable waste, when composted, can release the chemicals and toxins in the materials. Recycling now let's talk about recycling. Most recycling is actually downcycling, which means it reduces the quality of material over time. For example, the high quality steel used in automobiles is recycled by melting it down with other car parts, including copper, paints, and plastic. As a result, the quality of material goes down. To make up for the lost quality, more high quality steel may be added to make the hybrid strong enough for the next use. But still, it will not provide the same material properties to make a new car again. Another good example is a soda can, which consists of two kinds of aluminium. The wall is composed of aluminium, magnesium alloy with some magnesium, plus coating and paint, while the harder top is aluminium magnesium alloy. Now imagine what happens when these materials are mixed together. Their properties change. That's exactly what happens in conventional recycling. These materials are melted together in order to be recycled and resulting in a weaker and less useful product. Lost value and lost materials are not the only concern here. One good example is of plastics. When some plastics are melted and combined, the polymers in the plastics, the chains that make it strong and flexible, are shortened. Since the material properties of this recycled plastic are altered, chemical and mineral additives may be added to attain the desired performance quality. As a result, downcycled plastic may have more additives than virgin waste. And last but not least, recycling is actually more expensive because it tries to force materials into more lifetime than they were originally designed for, hence requiring more energy and resources. Regulate Regulate means we all have to remember our responsibilities, be it the government or the public. Do we need a stronger law? Or can we just be a nice person and follow the 3 R rules? But the problem is, there isn't enough guidance for the public. The explanation of how to save the environment is as vague as the definition of eco-efficient. Eco-efficient is a definitely admirable concept, but it is not a strategy to success over a long time because it does not reach deep enough. Relying on eco-efficiency to save the environment will in fact achieve the opposite. It will let the industry finish off everything, quietly, persistently and completely. Now let's look at how it would look like if we design a system with keeping eco-efficient in mind. 
release fewer pounds of toxic waste every year, measure prosperity by less activity, meet the conditions of thousands of regulations to keep people and natural system from being poisoned too quickly, produce fewer materials that are so dangerous that they will require future generations to maintain constant vigilance while living in terror, result in smaller amount of useless waste, put a smaller amount of valuable materials in holes all over the planet where they can never be retrieved. Efficient at what? Here's a nice example. In Germany, 20 years ago, the standard rate of oil used for heating and cooling the average house was 30 liters per square meter per year. Today, with high efficient housing, it is 1.5 liters of oil per square meter. This increase in efficiency is often achieved due to better insulation and smaller leak-proof windows. Although these strategies are meant to optimize the system and reduce wasted energy, this actually reduces air exchange rates which intensifies the concentration of indoor air pollution from poorly designed materials. Another example from Turkey shows that efficient building can also be dangerous. Several years ago, Turkey's government designed and constructed inexpensive housing which were built efficiently with a minimum of steel and concrete. During 1999 earthquakes, this building easily collapsed while other inefficient buildings held up better. What about agriculture? In the past, efficient agriculture is seen depleting local landscape and wildlife. Take a look at the example of Germany again. During the time when there were West Germany and East Germany, the West produced double the amount of wheat per acre than East because agricultural industry in the West was more efficient and modern. However, the eastern efficient and more old-fashioned agriculture was actually better for the environment as it has larger wetland areas that have not been drained and overtaken by monocultural crops and they contain more rare species. Last but not least, this does not mean efficient is bad at all. When being implemented as a tool within a larger efficient system that intends overall positive effects on a wide range of issues, Eco-efficiency can actually be a valuable one. It can be used as to slow down current system and turn around. So what do we do? We should make the goal where there is zero waste, zero emissions, and zero ecological footprint. Thank you for watching. In the next chapter, we go deep into eco-effectiveness.